Hi. It's great to be here. Thank you so much, Emmett and Zoe and everybody else and all of you who are braving the cold to be here in the warmth. Um, this, I'm going to actually not be talking so much about what I've uh, written about in my book. My book's about an architectural history of artifi artificial intelligence. But in the process of writing that book, I've become very interested in questions about artificial intelligence and pop culture and exactly what this thing means. What does it mean when we say AI? And what do we think it means when we say AI? And when I approach it, I probably do what a lot of people do, which is I Google it. <laughs> so I put in AI is the new, and a bunch of different things come out. So I get things like AI is the new black. So everything's the new black, right? AI is the new user interface. Also, AI is about to become your company's digital spokesperson. McKinsey, the consulting firm, tells us that artificial intelligence is the next digital frontier. Report, AI is the new space race, and the US needs a Sputnik moment. Andrew Ng said that AI is the new electricity. This is one that gets quoted a lot. And when he left Baidu, the Chinese company where he worked, he instead started a new online university. And now AI pioneer Andrew Ng says his new on online course will help build an AI-powered society. This is Chicago. We've got to include sports, right? So AI is the new MVP in sports. Here's one where I just highlighted the word new. I think I got six in the first screen of this article alone, although one of them was for New York, so I don't think that really counts. <laughs> Google's AI is a new paradigm that unites humans and machines, and data is the new oil, because we need data to run artificial intelligence. And then finally, even I am the new AI. This is um, for something called the grid, um, and it's actually some pretty sexist uh, language here talking about what this AI assistant would be like. It says, she's quirky, but will never ghost you, never charge more, never miss a deadline, never cower to your demands for a bigger logo. <laughs> I'm not going to go into the, the whole history of AI and gendering on this talk, but, uh, but we could bookmark that for another session. But here's the thing. AI isn't the new anything, because it isn't new. In fact, we've been using the term artificial intelligence since 1955, um, when it was coined by John McCarthy. He was the co-founder of the MIT AI Lab and the founder of the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab. And he described artificial intelligence as making machines do things that would require intelligence if done by humans. There's another really old idea about artificial intelligence that we talk about a lot today as well. We talk about human-computer symbiosis, the idea that people and machines might work together really closely and the resulting partnership would be completely different. And this is exactly what JCR Licklider, who is a major force in the funding and development of artificial intelligence um, throughout throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And so he wrote a, a piece called Man-Computer Symbiosis and said that human-computer symbiosis will involve the close coupling between the human and electronic members of the partnership. And he went on to say, the hope is that in not too many years, human brains and computing machines will be coupled together very tightly, and the resulting partnership will think as no human brain has ever thought and process data in a way not approached by the information handling machines we know today. 1960. And Marvin Minsky, the co-founder of the MIT AI Lab, who died about a year or two ago, wrote in 1961 that he believed that we are on the threshold of an era that will be dominated by, that will be strongly influenced and quite possibly dominated by intelligent problem-solving machines. And that's why this gives me pause a little bit when someone like Elon Musk in 2015 declares that this is an era of artificial intelligence. It's as though they want to claim ownership over something new, but it's actually not very new. They want to claim a whole new world, and people like him have an agenda. So what is that world like? If, again, if we go and look at it and see how the images of this world look like, we see her, 
This I like to call Cyborg Lady. The Cyborg Lady has some JavaScript code going over her face. You can see this uh, bit of a computer chip cast over her. She shows up in a lot of different kinds of articles. Hundreds and hundreds of articles. I love this. Brits fear the AI future, so Cyborg Lady might be British. It's possible Cyborg Lady works at IBM. IBM Watson, the ingredient brand helping inform the purposeful business of tomorrow. And then my personal favorite, I think she works at IKEA. <laughs> Artificial intelligence embedded in, in furniture, IKEA is considering. And the fact is, when you, look, when you do a Google image search for AI, these are the kinds of things you see. And you see the same kinds of things, right? You see images of brains and sort of robot bodies. They're not quite human. And you see lines, and it's sort of like flying into Chicago at night, where the grid stretches out and it's, it's all lit up. You see those kinds of circuit lines, um, robot hands, eyeballs, sometimes the word AI. And you see this kind of Cartesian grid of a head and the grid of the world and these, you know, this knowledge and these, this light or the beholding of a hand with a lot of circuitry and circuit boards. And one of my students took a look at all of these images and, and Google image search and came up with the fact that these are the five most commonly used colors in all of these images. And he, he said that these colors and shapes are quite familiar to me when I think of AI. And when he was looking at them, he was pointing out that what do we associate these with? Cold, rational, objective, unemotional. All of these things are the colors we use. And he pointed out that you also begin to see them to a large extent in a lot of movie posters, right? So here are a few movies. Um, I'll show a few more in a minute. You see these colors and, and these kinds of cliches play out in movies like Minority Report, where people were, um, were flagged for pre-crime, you know, crime prevention ahead of time. And probably if you've seen this movie from 2002, you remember Tom, uh, excuse me, Tom Cruise playing with the interfaces that are these um, kind of holograms in front of him. A little bit different aversion is the movie Her. This is Joaquin Phoenix, and um, he downloads a, an OS and falls in love with her. Her name is Samantha. She's played by Scarlett Johansson. And if you see this movie, you see all these kind of rosy red optimistic colors um, like you see right here. Or you see this movie. This is from a shot from Ex Machina, where um, a man is creating robots that are indistinguishable from the, from the real thing, a kind of real life Turing test, while he traps people in a scary uh, hotel in Norway. And um, this is sort of the fembot cliche, the, the possibly evil female or the possibly extremely docile female. And then there's the one that we probably all know from 50 years ago this year, 2000, and HAL 9000. And I like the fact that you see this red. It's like kind of malevolent. And you've got the blue of the HAL. And of course, you get, I'm sorry, Dave. I can't do that. So why are we using these cliches? That's something I want to dive into a little bit. Eric Johnson, in an article he wrote for Recode, wrote that these cultural cliches, <coughs> cliches and touchstones are popular for another reason. It's really, really hard to talk about digital reality tech otherwise. These fields are full of jargon, inconsistent in practice, and difficult to grok if you haven't seen all the latest demos. Pop culture is a shortcut to a common ideal or a shared vision. So that's what these movies do for us, right? They give us an opportunity, a way to understand what, what these concepts are, to play them out. They actually are a shortcut. They, they give us a chance to, um, to communicate in shorthand. And that's probably a good thing, because when you try to buy images, you see things like this. I like this little um, tool tip that came up that says, artificial intelligence series, background design of 3D illustration of human face and computer elements on the subject of superhuman AI, computer consciousness, and technology. I don't know about you, but I find this kind of scary. It's true, yeah, he's cross-eyed, that doesn't help. 
And this is even what we see on the Google homepage. If you do regular Google search engine results, this is the page and the box that leads you to the Wikipedia page on artificial intelligence. And you've got this creepy eye and some dots and code kind of going down in front of it. And I don't think it does a very good job of foregrounding exactly what we're talking about. Part of that problem is because a lot of times when we're thinking about artificial intelligence, we're thinking about the black box. And a black box is, um, a, to quote the OED, um, a device which performs intricate functions but whose internal mechanism may not be readily inspected or understood. So it's something that we understand because of the inputs and the outputs, but we can't see what it does. We don't have a way in. And frankly, it's hard to communicate about AI because communicating it means understanding it. And let's face it, most of us don't. And so that's why we turn to things like metaphors and cliches. I went back when I was putting this talk together, and um, maybe some of you will revisit your high school English classes with me, and uh, the English majors in the room will, will forgive me for doing this. But the point of a metaphor is to describe the unknown, right? So in order, um, Earl McCormick writes, in order to describe the unknown, we must resort to concepts that we know and understand. And that is the essence of a metaphor, an unusual juxtaposition of the familiar and the unfamiliar. And we've all been encouraged to use metaphors in our art and in our writing and in our poetry. In fact, a particularly good metaphor can carry you quite some distance when you're trying to communicate. I liked this passage by W.V. Quine in his article, A Postscript on Metaphor. Along the philosophical fringes of science, we may find reasons to question basic conceptual structures and to grope for ways to refashion them. Old idioms are bound to fail us here, and only metaphor can begin to limb the new order. If the venture succeeds, the old metaphor may die and be embalmed in a newly literalistic idiom accommodating the changed perspective. I think that that starts to explain what we're dealing with, that we're in a world where technology is actually accelerating. And while AI is quite old, we're actually seeing its results now. We're living in that world. And it's, it's surrounding everything we do. So we do need to question these basic structures. But how do we explain it? This is why metaphor helps. And this is why we're turning to some of these different methods. However, metaphors and cliches are two different things. And Oxford English Dictionary will remind us that a cliche uh, has several different meanings. I found this first one really interesting. It's a 19th century term for an image, for a plate that was used for making an image. It's also, in language terms, a phrase or expression regarded as unoriginal or trite. A very predictable or unoriginal person or thing, the person you hate seeing at the cocktail party or at work, the person that you try to avoid from the water cooler, a trite or stereotyped idea of someone or something, and then finally again, hackneyed and trite. So we hear that cliches are bad, right? Metaphors good, cliches bad. And I'll dig into, throughout the rest of this talk, reasons that they might actually help us along a little bit. In 1970, Alvin Toffler wrote in his book Future, so Future Shock about what happens when we're in a state of a lot of new technolo technology and how it affects us. And in the book, he wrote, what happens when something, in, when something in our environment is altered? All of us are constantly bathed in the shower of signals from our environment, visual, auditory, tactile. Most of these come in routine, repetitive patterns when something changes within the range of our senses, the pattern of signals pouring through our sensory channels into our nervous system is modified. The routine repetitive patterns are interrupted. Into this interruption, we respond in a particularly acute fashion. And I think that some of this repetition can actually be useful to us as we're trying to understand the integration of technology into our world. You may be familiar with the notion of the uncanny valley. Has anyone heard that term before? A little bit? So the uncanny valley is the weird feeling we get when robots are too similar to us, or some kind of being is too similar to us, and it's not an actual human 
right? Um, it's the area where we feel eerie or frankly just freaked out. And this is, this is from a study in 1970 by Masahiro Mori on, on robotics. And basically, our affinity for robots grows until we reach a certain point, and then it crashes. And that's, that crash is what we call the uncanny valley. So a prosthetic hand um, that we expect to be real is going to freak us out. It's not going to feel right. But puppets or toy robots that are cute and friendlier, we're not going to have that feeling. And he said a couple of really interesting things in this article about the uncanny valley that I think says something about us as people. Um, he wrote, we should begin to build an accurate map of the uncanny valley so that through robotics research, we can come to understand what makes us, what makes us human. He also writes elsewhere in the article that um, I think this descent explains the secret lying deep beneath the uncanny valley. Why were we equipped with this eerie sensation? Is it essential for human beings? I have not yet considered these questions deeply, but I have no doubt it is an integral part of our, of our instinct for self-preservation. So I think that when we find ourselves contending with technology or robots or whatever it might be, and we have that moment of, of distance, that might be there to do us some good. I want to suggest that there are some approaches in AI and robotics that help us to understand what makes us human. I'm going to give you some amusing examples um, in the work of a woman named Janelle Shane, who is uh, by day a, an optics researcher. She's an engineer. And by night, she trains algorithms to do really funny things. She trains neural nets. She runs a website called AI Weirdness. And if any of this stuff is amusing to you, or if you remember, I'll, I'll talk about her New York Times piece in a couple of minutes. Um, if you need a lift, it, it can leave you in, in stitches. So Janelle Shane has done things like take in data of guinea pig names from the Portland uh, guinea pig rescue and generated new guinea pig names. The way that a, the way that a neural net works, it's sort of modeled on human, human biology, um, the way the human brain works. And it gets a big data set and it starts it, the algorithm looks for patterns in the data set. It knows nothing at the beginning, doesn't even know what letters are, what spaces are. And it sees what patterns emerge. And then when Janelle is working with these patterns, she sets certain parameters to make different kinds of things happen over time. So she's, tra she's trained any number of things. She generates recipes. She's generated knitting patterns. She's had people knit the knitting patter patterns. And of course, guinea pig names. As uh, my husband says, any kid could name a guinea pig Princess Pow, but it takes a neural net to name it Hanger Dan. <laughs> Recently in the New York Times, perhaps a couple of weeks ago, you saw that she took 7,000 ha um, Halloween costume ideas and trained a neural net on them. And then she worked with an artist to come up with illustrations for a number of them. And it's just hilarious. It's also a wonderful description of how neural nets work. So here you see zombie girl, toaster guy, and Donald McDonald. And these illustrations are by Jessie Ama. And she explains how these Halloween costume names emerge as she works with them. So. In Epic One, these are the names. And then she's not generating the drawings, I should say. These are done after the fact, but they're really pretty great. So Epic One, this is when the neural net doesn't know very much about anything. It's just looking for some basic patterns. So none of these make a lot of sense. There's Fustristus and Bupadano and Wetchray Bunzag Womb. And it, you can kind of, it's almost words, but not quite. And then four epics later, so training, 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 you start seeing some other things emerge. You see, there's Princess Laia, Dorothy from Grouch, Sexy the Babby Kahepper. Um, you see Tranch Van, Regun, and um, I think possibly my favorite, Frankenstein's Bunny. And then you get to the ninth epic. So there's a lot more. Um, I think the title of the New York Times piece was Ruth Bader Hat Guy. <laughs> Elsa, but finger, pirate. <laughs> 
alien chest man, gummy cow, just really strange and really funny. And you wonder why each of these epics seems to catch on to something new about the network. And the thing is, is we can't see inside the neural network to figure out why it makes those decisions. Um, recently, researchers at my university, Carnegie Mellon, apparently learned that neural nets that are trying to do image recognition have figured out that they can, I, have, they've figured out that the algorithms can identify a dog by the curve of the dog's floppy ear. So the algorithm knows that that means dog. That's that's the that's what it, it it is. But I'm not sure that it really helps us with Halloween costumes. Another thing is in any list of Halloween costumes provided by adults, it's sexy this or sexy that. And that was, not surprisingly, a pattern that um, the neural net picked up pretty early. So here you might see things like sexy King Louis the Sixteenth, sexy Michael Sarah, sexy printer, sexy Minecraft person. So. If uh, the couple of you are laughing, just go read her website. It's 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 brilliant, sexy printer. Um, but she also points out, you know, to the to the point that Masahiro Mori was making with the idea of the uncanny valley. I think that she starts pointing out how we can learn what algorithms do to us, and it's part of the joy of her work. So she was doing image recognition. Hmm. Okay. Just realized this was kind of waving. Um, she's doing image recognition on um, rocky hillsides with pastures. And she found that the descriptions that Microsoft Azure's algorithm were providing always said that there were sheep there when there are no sheep. She's wondering, does it hallucinate sheep? And then she saw sheep in a field and she colored them orange and the algorithm said flowers. That, that must be flowers in a field. And then she found this nice image of goats in a tree and gave that to the algorithm and it said, one algorithm said, um, that's a flock of birds flying in the air and another said, it's a group of giraffes next to the tree. And here's what she says about these exercises. If life plays by the rule, image recognition works well. But as soon as people or sheep do something unexpected, the algorithms show their weaknesses. And I think that this is an interesting concept. I'm going to show you a, a short 30 second video next. Um, it's of a project by Madeline Gannon, who just finished her PhD in architecture at Carnegie Mellon. And she is a robot whisperer. She trained a robot to interact with people in some really unusual and fun ways. And um, they have to keep the robot's attention to get the robot to interact, this big robotic industrial arm. And um, she placed it at the Design Museum in London for six months. And she says something really interesting about it. Oops, I think we don't have sound here. Can we get sound? Uh, and you just have a very raw experience with this animal-like machine responding to your every move. All the technical aspects sort of melt away into the background. It's incredibly important to have opportunities and spaces to come in and experiment and misuse these existing technologies. So as she said, you know, ways to misuse existing technologies. This, this robotic arm went back to work on an auto line. This is a Swedish ABB robot. And so it went back and did its regular job after its six months in the museum. But in the meantime, people were confronted or with the possibility of thinking differently of how one might interact with that robot and what that might mean. I'm gonna change gears a little bit to a different kind of cliche. And this is, um, That'll allow, something that'll allow us to talk a little bit about the ethics of these systems. And this is the trolley problem. Is anyone here familiar with the trolley problem? A couple people? Okay. So the trolley problem is this. You are the guy with the switch. And there is a trolley, and it is coming down the tracks. And ahead of you, there are five people tied to the track. And you have a choice of whether you let the trolley run over the five people or whether you throw the switch to have it run over the one person. What's the right thing to do? What? Put it in reverse. What else? Blow it up. Blow it up. 
stop it, but you. But this is just it, right? There's no, what you're saying is effectively there's no good option. And that's why this is a problem that's used a lot in ethics classes. But it's also the problem that everybody turns to to describe the trade-offs of autonomous vehicles, right? Because eventually there's a question of who are you going to kill? And people are going to die as autonomous vehicles um, proliferate. So, so what's the right answer? However, there are also a lot of memes about trolley problems. Lots and lots of them, like here's the trolley problem solved. It's just one big loop. Um, yeah, it's something like, I don't know, 250 trolley problem memes. There's this particular uh, definition, this particular solution. Uh-oh, Nicholas. This train is going to crash into these five people. Should we move the train to go this way, or should we let it go that way? Which way should the train go? This way. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I think he might have been on board with a couple of you who are saying blow it up or both of them. I personally like the fact that there's a trolley problem guy mug. I really want this mug. And this is my favorite meme. <laughs> we get to this idea that if we could just slap some ethics into these systems, I think we'd all be okay. And we all know that it's a lot more complicated than that for all of the reasons we've been talking about. Because Algorithms concern things like fairness and accountability, law enforcement, and matters of life and death. And there are things that we discover, right? That Palantir has secretly been using New Orleans to test its predictive policing technology, right? This is, Palantir is a consulting firm, very data-driven, and even the mayor of the city was unaware that the city was being used for these purposes. And of course, there are things like Cambridge Analytica, or decisions that maybe we would not have made, um, or things we wouldn't have chosen to participate in if we'd actually had the full knowledge. Did anyone here get a chance to see Mimi Onuha? Isn't, can we just like have a round of applause for her awesomeness? Um, I'm, a, I'm a gigantic fan of her work, and for those of you who didn't get to see her talk about uncollected data sets, um, missing data sets, Here's the question, right? You can only analyze the data that you have. And so if you haven't collected the data, that data cannot be parsed or analyzed. And while it's very scary to see data misused or people be surveyed, on the other hand, you can't begin to have change or algorithmic justice if you don't actually collect the data. So um, Mimi's project includes um, a GitHub repository, a digital repository of missing data sets. But when she displays it in an art gallery, she puts all of the missing data sets into a file cabinet, each of which is labeled, and all of the file folders are, of course, empty. So potential missing data sets. But one of them, um, she points out, she pointed out in 2017 that one such missing data set was African American men killed in confrontations with police officers when they were unarmed. That was a data set that was begun to be collected, and after that, changes at least, or awareness and activism happened in new kinds of ways. So again, we see this question of the black box, right? We can't see in, we can only see the inputs and the outputs. And Maybe what we'd want to say is, we'll just make the black box transparent. Make the black box just tell us everything that it's doing. But that doesn't work either. Um, it isn't enough to just be transparent, because transparency is, as we all know from experiences in our own lives, transparency can be harmful. It can occlude things. It can make things even more opaque by providing too much information. It can set up false binaries. And it has technical and tem temporal limitations, doesn't work over time, right? And these are, these are just a few of the arguments that Mike Anany and Kate Crawford give in this particular piece. 
this is a description of uh, kind of the whole give and take that one of my students, Gray Crawford, did. Um, and it's a little bit hard to read, but he used Disney Fantasia to show how the trade-offs work with, with algorithms and why these, these things are kind of difficult. So up here, you see it say, algorithm design, and then statistical inference and AI researchers. They're trying to figure out what emerges. And then this says human hubris. And then a misalignment of value, right? I'm having problems reading, reading this myself. But bit by bit, you have this continued problem of value misalignment that happens. And I like the fact that he used Fantasia to illustrate it. I think the bigger concern is something different, to make it so that people can interpret what algorithms are doing. Because interpretation is different than transparency. And there are a number of different, there are a number of examples out there. These are just, you know, recent articles, I think, over the last year, and the majority of these over the last month, um, that show some ways that, ha some things that happen when we start to at least visualize or surface the workings of an algorithm so that we can interpret it. Um, this piece right here refers to something in my county, the Allegheny uh, County Family Screening Tool, which is used to assess whether a child um, in danger is likely to be removed from its family in the next um, two years. And it's a very difficult question. 100 different data sources, it definitely surfaces possibilities, and, um, and yet those data sources are probably biased and troubled but they're studying it, and they're trying to make it interpretable, so that's something. I found it um, heartening to know that the Department of Defense might like to explore the ethics of AI in war. Um, this piece, When Your Boss is an Algorithm, is um, an, ar an article, or excuse me, a, a chapter from Uberland, looking at what happens for workers who drive um, for services like Lyft or um, Uber. Or Amazon scrapes, scrapes secret AI recruiting tool that showed bias against women. In fact, it, it had trained itself to even start looking at women's colleges and saying that was a, a bad thing. Um, and then finally, looking at schools like MIT or Carnegie Mellon, where we're looking at different ways to bring together the humanities and AI in new ways. Um, I like the old ways just fine, but I'm also heartened by the new possibilities. So here's another one of these images I find. Is artificial intelligence a good thing? And again, I find myself looking at these questions of metaphors. Um, this is probably my favorite definition of a metaphor, that a metaphor is advice for seeing something in terms of something else. It brings out the thisness of that or the thatness of a this. I wonder about the thisness and the thatness of these different algorithms. Potentially, I think one thing we could say is that maybe cliches aren't all bad either, right? Because they help us to make sense of things. They help us to quickly explain things. And remember that, uh, at that Alvin Toffler quote that I provided sort of near the beginning of this talk about this question of repetition. Hugh Rank, in a piece called A Few Good Words for Cliches, said that we need repetitive routines Repetitive routines help smooth things down for us, help us feel at home. And that, in fact, repetition is delightful. Just ask anyone who likes going to their favorite restaurant over, over, over and over. One question I have is maybe we need new cliches. So I asked a couple of students that I work with what they thought. Um, Jay, the student who took the, the color samples from all of the AI posters, came up with his own new cliche. And here's what's going on here. He thinks that artificial intelligence would be shy, curious, and maybe happy. And so you've got these masks of black over to, be, to stand in for shyness, but these kind of amorphous boundaries and these happy light colors to show that curiosity. Or Tilo, Tilo Kruger came up with um, a cliche that he calls hair with the A and the I capitalized. 
And this is just kind of a flowing, beautiful interaction that he began to explore um, that was a lot more like human hair. Or there's this one, which kind of reminds me of the blue meanies from Yellow Submarine. Um, this is this mouth eating up lots of different kind of data and churning it before it spits it back out. So maybe three possible ways of envisioning new, uh, new AI. Um, after, I, after I sent in my slides here, I noticed, I learned of a new rebranding campaign for AI that a design magazine took on. And uh, there were some other really provocative ideas there too. So in the end, there are people like Oprah who might tell us that you get a machine learning, we all get a machine learning. <laughs> and this is by my house. <laughs> I live in the neighborhood in Pittsburgh where all of the autonomous vehicle companies are. And um, Carnegie Robotics is the um, tech transfer arm of Carnegie Mellon University and the National Robotics Engineering Center. And they're still hiring humans. But maybe in the end, we might stop here and just say that cliches are maybe bad, maybe good, but they're cliches for a reason. So thank you. And we have time for questions. So we will be circulating with these mics. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We will bring the mic to you and please stand. Over here. Thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, <clears throat> one of the questions I have about AI um, in transforming the old book Singularity because we now have big data <clears throat> and we have some very new things that are going on in the field. The question I have for you is, do you see uh, an impact from what we call infinite computing once the quantum computer gets invented and online. A computer that can think for itself, ask its own questions, and answer its own questions. Don't we make a transformative leap from essentially this era of robotics? <clears throat> AI is kind of a misnomer because it, it really doesn't think for itself. It right. has to be programmed. Right. And I'm wondering if you could comment on the advent of quantum computing and the so-called infinite uh, computer in the AI field. I'm almost, I'm, I'm inclined to ask you what you think. I, I really am, because I wonder, I think lots of people have different perspectives on it, so I wonder what you think. In attending some seminars, including some by the military, <laughs> this maybe is more than you want, I think there will be a sixth extinction that, um, because our planet will be unlivable, and I think that what's going to happen in advance of that, because our DNA and RNA is all digitalized and can be digitalized, with an infinite computer, you can put in that human element into the machine. You now have a machine that can think for itself, does not need to be programmed, does not need to have goals like the so-called Facebook Harmony program that just came out right. for everybody to use. That has to be programmed. This won't, and I think we will have a new species, and I think that's where we will end up by the turn of the century. A lot of ideas in there too. So you're there. You're referring to a few things that um, it's possible people here have heard of things like the singularity and Ray Kurzweil, which is a notion that we will all be able to upload our consciousness into some kind of computer and essentially never, never die. And there's another idea in there as well, which is the. Um, the idea of ultra intelligence, which was the 1964 version and the 2016 version by Nick Bostrom, is super intelligence. The idea that maybe these computers that think for themselves are not going to feel so charitable about us small people and uh, get rid of the pesky humans and wipe them out of existence. So I don't know. You know, I really, I really don't know where we will head with this, but I find it, again, interesting that they're questions that we've been asking for as long as we've had computing, these questions about consciousness. Um, and I think they're really provocative questions. Thank you. Are there any new medical procedures that have been developed by artificial intelligence? Hmm. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I know that there are different kinds of ways that 
doctors and hospitals and medical researchers work with AI um, and patient medicine. One thing that comes to mind is not procedure, but rather using um, machine learning and nat natural, uh, natural language processing to capture the interaction between a doctor and patient so that the patient can have it and so patterns in it can be found to improve patient outcomes. So this is something that a company called abridge.ai uh, is working on. But the answer is yes, probably, and I'm not sure because I don't, I don't have a lot of depth in the medical field. We have a question over here. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, what do you foresee the economic impact of uh, artificial intelligence replacing certain uh, jobs like transportation and retail and other areas that can be automated? Do you think there's a real threat to the economy in the coming decades? And if so, what uh, could or should be done? Um, I think that it will, I think that low level processes that could be served by a computer probably will be. But also we've been talking about coming automation since the 1960s and the societal impacts of it. And so sometimes I wonder if, you know, like the same way we've been talking about AI for as long as we have, maybe this is a longer timeline. Um, my hope is that it will be possible that it will be possible to educate people and train people for new kinds of careers. Um, I'm not so certain about things like universal basic income. Um, not sure that that solves problems for us, but I, I, I'm not as well read on that part of the question. Um, I think it's a question of what leisure begins to look like and what education begins to look like in this new kind of um, world. And I think that's what we'd actually need to look toward. And when I look f at a room full of people who very clearly care about the humanities and yet will come to your talk on AI in the realm of the humanities, maybe we can give some thought to what that education would be like. We have a question over here. I'm probably a minority of one, but you used terms that I don't understand. You showed, uh, I think it was a person, a guy, downloading an OS. Mm -hmm. I don't know what OS is. And also, a little later, Grok, G-R-O-K, and then OED. OED, okay, so OS stands for, thank you for that. and. Um, this is where I have to check my own language because sometimes I get so used to talking to techie people in their 30s. So I really appreciate you asking and you are not the only person who needed to know the answers. Yeah, I am really glad you did, thank you. Okay, so an, oper an OS is an operating system and in the movie Her, um, it becomes this, it becomes this, invisible character that ma one of the main characters of the movie that Joaquin Phoenix is constantly talking to and falling in love with. She's his computer's operating system. She's this art in in artificial intelligent being. And uh, and yeah, that's, you know, this is what he actually falls in love with. And um, I won't give away the rest of the movie in case anyone here might see it who hasn't. Um, I said OED, and that was shorthand for Oxford English Dictionary. Um, so in that, and then you'd also asked about grok. That is about the nerdiest word ever. <laughs> and um, and I want to say that like magazines, like Wired magazine in the '90s, got real excited about that one. And that's um, that means to understand, to get your head around it. Is there, are there any other things that need a clarification or two? False binaries. False binaries. So non-equivalent things. Apple, false binaries is apples and oranges. We have a question over here. Thank you for that. 
science fiction uh, writers have been envisioning the kind of future of AI for a long time, since 50s, 60s. Um, and generally, when they take it to the extreme, they th think of it as either a utopian outcome or a dystopian outcome. Do you think one of the two of those is inevitable? Both and? <laughs> Um, I admit that I have a real fascination for dystopian narratives and uh, the ways they get depicted. In the class, this semester I'm teaching a class called AI and Culture, and we just watched in the same week Hunger Games from 2012 and Fahrenheit 451 from 1966. Has anyone seen either of those movies? They're just beautifully designed and worth watching again as a way to even look at where we stand today with these with these different kinds of worlds. Um, I like them because they are dystopian, and yet there's some hope at the end. In Hunger Games, there's a power power differential, power change, and uh, in Fahrenheit 451, everyone becomes a book. And uh, they memorize their books and walk around and inhabit them. So I don't know. I mean, I, I tend to think that the real world is somewhere in between. But then again, um, I'm still shocked by the results of the 2016 election. <laughs> we have a question over here. Since we've gotten into science fiction, um, Grok, I believe, comes from the Robert Heinlein book, uh, Stranger in a Strange Land, originally. Awesome. Thank you. And. Um, Asimov had three rules of robotics, yep. and the first rule was that you can't harm humans. One of the things I always think about of AI at some point, I mean, it already controls a lot of things, which leaves us very, very vulnerable to people hacking into those systems. Um, but at some point, if there is artificial intelligence, and artificial intelligence decides that its primary goal is the health of this planet, and it sees the one species that has done more harm to this planet than any others, <laughs> then you get your dystopian. Pattern recognition, right? Yeah. So wait, what are the three laws of robotics? The first one is? Um, you cannot harm a human. Um, I don't remember. I can't remember. You can't, you can't change either the first two. Yeah, the third one is you can't ignore the, the first two, and I don't remember what the second <laughs> one is. <laughs> We'll try and figure out what number two is. But yeah, these are his famous three laws of robotics. And so those the three laws of robotics and the trolley problem often get mentioned in the same I think the breath. second one may be that, if possible, you should prevent any harm to a human. You can't cause it. You should prevent it. Yep. You can't do anything that violates the first two. Oh, we might. OK, right over here. Also true, and yeah, there's the question of, it's difficult to make AI work without robotics. No, it's difficult for robotics to work these days without AI, but you're right, they're not the same thing. Um, you said that you also do ethics. So with the trolley problem, and you see it with um, self-driving cars, mm -hmm. do I kill my mother in front of me or those three people over there from an ethical standpoint what's the answer or what's well the you're sitting next to my mother so i'd like you to keep her safe <laughs> i'll use a different your mother-in-law <laughs> but um in the is there's there's no good answer right because you just don't want to see that happen and robotics researchers or autonomous vehicle researchers um, I, I mean I, I went to the Robotics Institute retreat and at Carnegie Mellon and one of the researchers on autonomous vehicles said look everyone knows the key thing is you must not have an autonomous vehicle kill a, kill a child that's rule number one but we don't have answers to this. And the pragmatic approach of people who work on autonomous vehicles is that humans are going to get killed in this process. However, humans get killed driving cars. So um, so it, it, the, the terrible and difficult and interesting part about talking about ethics is we just don't have good models for talking this through. And if we oversimplify it to a trolley problem, I'm afraid we don't get to the kinds of nuance that will allow us to help it through. We have a question over here. 
Hi, sorry, I'm sort of breaking the rules as staff, but um, <laughs> you talk about the moral implications, but I think there's also been a lot more research or at least the beginning of conversations. You mentioned it a little bit with Mimi's work, but there's also the sort of the cultural implications of AI because there's still people behind it, right? Mm -hmm. So there's all algorithms that aren't recognizing people of color, Absolutely. right? Or voice recognition that doesn't recognize an accent. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering at what point the, the sort of the moral or ethical dilemmas of AI are meeting the cultural implications, if it's if the technology world is still not fully diverse or inclusive. So how are you seeing that, or where do you think that's going to head? I would like to see, um, I'd like to see us train engineers, computer scientists, and designers from the earliest points to think about the implications of their work. We're beginning to incorporate ethics curriculum into um, the engineering curriculum at Carnegie Mellon. There are other ethical courses. Um, kind of, There's a bit of a swell for it. But the kinds of problems you're talking about have to do with things like Flickr, or I can't remember if it was Flickr or Yahoo in general, but Yahoo classified African Americans as apes. Or, um, and things like, um, there's a very funny YouTube video of uh, of two people who work in an electronics store, a computer store, who announce that um, HP computers are racist. It's an African-American man and a white woman. And they're standing in front of this computer that's supposed to, this computer camera that's supposed to track whoever's in front of it. And the guy stands in front of it, nothing. And then the woman gets in front of it, and it's moving around and following her, and he steps into the frame, nothing. And so somehow the, the motion sensor in the computer doesn't pick up dark skin. Or um, sensors for cameras that let you know if your eyes are closed, and they alert Asian um, faces to the fact that their eyes are closed when their eyes are open. So these are situations where things have made it into production, right? Where, and this is outside of AI in some ways, but computational devices in production, where if someone had considered that at the outset, then maybe we wouldn't have been there, right? Whether it's the data set or for images and the pattern recognition that Yahoo did, or um, HP's choice of sensors, or how they train motion detection, right? And so I think that it's necessary to educate a whole bunch of different people about those possibilities at the beginning so that we frame problems in a way that there's less unintended bias. And the thing is that we need bias. We can't do anything in life without having biases. Like we wouldn't be able to cross the street. I wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here, right? But unintended biases and harmful unintended biases are what we absolutely need to avoid. Question over here. Uh, hopefully simple. Uh, do you think artificial intelligence will ever give rise to curiosity? Yes, maybe. But in us or in, in the data set? Because one of the reasons that I always go back to Janelle Shane's work is aside from you know, once a week, leaving me absolutely breathless with laughter, um, is that it makes me think differently about the world. And one thing that I've been curious about is, you know, other points in time where we've turned to art or theater to help us think differently about the world, like the rise of Dadaism and um, what that meant in World War I when the world went to hell. And the only response art could have was, and it was an absurd response. Or um, someone like Eugene Ionesco, who's my favorite playwright, and his play Rhinoceros in 1959, where everyone in a small town turns into a rhinoceros. And it's a play about totalitarianism. I find myself looking at, again, my confusion around the political landscape today and wondering if some of these more subversive, funny things that algorithms do might give us some ways into critiquing the systems that produce them. So whether they get, they're curious themselves is a question of whether computers have consciousness, but I'm curious thanks to what they do. Thank you. The next question, the next question will be our final question. Just a reminder, there is a book signing in the lobby afterwards. Okay. 
the difficulty that you were speaking of uh, relating to the missing data sets, uh, uh, there's an architectural, uh, as you stamp on the shop drawings, revise and resubmit. Indeed. Revise and resubmit. I like that. But I'm not sure, was that, did I miss a question? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm confused. I, I, may, I may not have understood. When you stamp the shop drawing. Right. Okay, approved. Right. Approved as noted. Yep. Revise and resubmit or rejected. Revise and resubmit is yep. is is the uh, the missing data set. Try yep. again. Thank you. That makes sense. Revise. Yeah. Exactly. And maybe we're in one big societal moment of revise and resubmit, and that might be a good way to end. So thank you for that, and thank you for your excellent questions. <laughs>